Today, I'm going to be talking to you about psychedelic integration or psychedelic integration therapy. And I'd like you for a second to imagine uh, the two different roles that I have. There are two that were just mentioned. One, I'm a therapist on a study of uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, right? There we are administering MDMA. And then I have another, another role, and I'm actually going to move over here. So this is the other one, because it's very difficult to keep these separate. But the other role is as a uh, therapist in a private practice. This is my position as the director of the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program. And here we're working with people to help them prepare and integrate psychedelic experiences. But we aren't the people who are administering the psychedelic. So these, these, these clients may be going to retreats in Peru. They may be working with an underground therapist. They may be using psychedelics on their own. Or they may not be using psychedelics at all, but they may have questions about psychedelic use. I just want to mention Elizabeth Nielsen. You may have mentioned, or may have seen her talk. She uh, does this work with me. She's the director of training. Very accomplished. And we do this work at the Center for Optimal Living, which is a private practice in New York City. So our, our name is quite long uh, because we wanted to capture everything that we do, uh, education and care. Sometimes we refer it to the psychedelic program for short. So you may be familiar with this, this image. And this is just to drive home that integration happens after the, these MDMA or psilocybin sessions. But again, what we do is work in a private practice where we don't administer psychedelics. It's a key. We don't administer psychedelics. We don't refer to underground therapists. We don't refer to retreats, even when they are legal. We have our reasons for that, which I could explain later. And psychedelic integration, I like to say, is trans-theoretical. We don't have an ideological uh, uh, orientation that we're working from, uh, but we do work within a harm reduction psychotherapy framework. So we're, we're all about empowering the people that we work with. So this has important implications. For those of you here who are in the helping professions, who are not administering psychedelics in clinical trials. This is something that you can do. You can do that now. And my hope is that more people will be aware of this work so that with the increasing popularity of psychedelics, people who are um, in a position to care know how to respond. So you're probably familiar with this book. If not, it's probably being translated into your language and will be available shortly. Uh, and uh, I would argue that the there's an increased attention to psychedelics. I think that's clear by the media, but also by the scientific community. And uh, there are also legally available psychedelic compounds, ketamine in the uh, United States. And MDMA and, and psilocybin will... May li uh, are likely to become available soon. But I would also argue that there are unrecognized negative consequences to psychedelic use. Sorry, my screen just disappeared. Um, now, we have the I have a longer version of this in my talk where I discuss um, these negative consequences. Uh, I'm not able to get into them here, but the DSM only recognizes some of them. My screen is going completely blank. Ah, okay, I'm back. Nope. It's flashing on and off. Um, so so if, you, if you begin to do this work, you may have clients coming into your private practice saying, well, I tried ayahuasca and now I am suffering from panic attacks. Or I heard psilocybin can cure my depression. Where do I start? Uh, or I plan to go to Peru. What, what should I know? So in order to, to correct what we see as a deficit of understanding in the mental health field generally, we've created a workshop where 
professionals can go, clinicians can go, to learn more. And this includes, we teach about the history of psychedelic research, we talk about current psychedelic research, but we also go into more details around um, doing actual integration psychotherapy. And I want to share with you some of what we teach, except that's a two-day course and I have about 20 minutes. So I'll do my best. We also provide individual work therapy, group therapy, etc. And we've trained over 550 clinicians at this point. So we, some of the things that we teach that I won't be able to get into is how to do a sort of psychedelically informed assessment, how to identify contraindications and risks, um, and then our favorite question that we always leave to the end, I'm giving you a little bit of a spoiler, but how do you respond to your client when they ask you, have you ever tried a psychedelic? So what is psychedelic integration? It's kind of a complicated answer, uh, question, but I like to use this, first I like to use the spectrum for people to think about when is it that the psychedelic integration is taking place and for how long? In other words, is this something that a person does at a festival environment after somebody uh, visits the Zendo exclusively? Is it part of short-term treatment? Is it part of long-term treatment? And clients will want different things. Some people want to be engaged in a long-term treatment to continue the relationship with their therapist as they may choose to or choose not to engage in psychedelics. But generally what psychedelic integration means is trying to sustain the benefits that a psychedelic experience brings, whether that is uh, improving well-being or treating symptoms. Um, Rosalind Watts talked about embodiment, and that is also a, a key part of our work. So how can people embody what they, what they get, what they learn, and it's, that it's not just through, through talking. Right? We, we, psychotherapy is about talking, and that is one mode of, of integration, but we want to also honor and integrate other ways. And I like to say that psychedelic integration is important. People are very interested in integration right now, but I want to make clear that I don't think everybody needs to be in integration therapy. I think people can very successfully integrate psychedelic experiences entirely on their own. But I think it is also important that mental health providers are prepared for people who need extra support or people who just want the extra support. So often, when I ask a person who comes in for integration work, what brings them in, one of the things they say is, I have tried everything and nothing worked, and so I want to try psychedelics. And what that also tells me I kind of deduce that we're maybe also working with people who have more severe symptoms or more treatment resistant symptoms or more complicated presentations. And I also want to make people aware that the culture really matters of where you're doing this work. It's going to maybe look different to doing integration in a Maloka at a, a retreat than it is going to be in New York City. People are multi Motiv varied in their motivation. And I've, and I've seen all of these different kinds of examples, uh, including people who are coming from Wall Street and want to microdose to be more focused. An interesting one that's a little bit counterintuitive that I want to bring your attention to is ketamine clinics. Um, so what's interesting about that is you wouldn't generally think that this is not ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. These are people who have depression who are going to a ketamine clinic legally, uh, but find themselves in distress sometimes after the experience and not really having anywhere to go to. And those are also people who we work with. So what are some early challenges in psychedelic integration work? And this is to just give you a taste of some of the things that, you know, if you, if you put psychedelic integration therapy on your website, what are some of the things that you might encounter? Oh, that's the screen. So one is, <laughs> I read Michael Pollan's book, and I want to cure my depression, and where do I start? So you might be thinking as a therapist, one of the first things that might go through your head is, do I encourage or do I discourage this person from taking a psychedelic? And the way, in short form, how we address this question is that we're the harm reduction philosophy is about empowering the client to make their own decision. 
So we want to develop a relationship with them and have trust and help them think through what are the implications of that decision. And if even psychedelics are the path forward, I mean, it could be meditation, holotropic breathwork, there are alternatives. Often people are fixated when they come to us that, that psychedelics have to be the answer. And sometimes that's the, the choice that they make. Why are they seeking psychedelics now? And the, one of the key challenges and questions is, how does a client understand what you provide as a service? Do, do, do you understand the implications of that question? <laughs> so we get a fair number of emails and phone calls that, are, that say, so I heard that you offer psychedelic-assisted therapy. When, when can I come in and get my MDMA dose with you? So I have to clarify, no, no, that's not what we do. And I say, oh, okay, I understand that you don't do that. So if I bring my own MDMA and I come in, hypothetically, could you, and, and no, 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 that really, this is not a wink, wink, like we really don't, don't do that. Uh, sometimes there's a fair amount of convincing and people then choose not to, to work with us, under, you know, understandably. And another key, key item is, how do they understand what this process is gonna be like and what's the outcome? So there's an assumption that people are going to experience the same kind of results as the obtained in the clinical trials. They'll read a newspaper and say, ah, this is what happens, psilocybin cures depression, so if I do psilocybin, I'll be cured. Mm, well, the set of circumstances are completely different. Integration starts with preparation. So we all, I think most of you are probably familiar with the concept of intention setting, and that's something that we might talk about. But we also like to ask, what have you received from your psychedelic experience so far? What has been uh, a goal for you? What is the purpose? Where would you like to, what would you like to be different? What are the obstacles that have gotten in your way so far? So sometimes this is not about the psychedelic experience at all. It's about other things that are going on in this person's life. So I'm really flying through these quite quickly. So, so what is, what's going on? How do you go from an experience to lasting change? And this is my very quick attempt to sort of get at this a little bit. Well, one, it depends on what you think the mechanism of action is. This is not really a, an answer. This is a, uh, more questions. <laughs> um, so, do you, but it's important. It's important to understand what is the client's understanding of, of what they imagine is gonna happen. Is it a transpersonal mystical experience? Is it an experience of, of healing between people? You know, I had a client who uh, chose, who wanted to do MDMA with his wife for marital purposes. And, and I think the, the intention there was to repair a relationship, to, um, to be able to feel love again. Or is it something intrapsychic? Which I think there's just a, the, the mystical and the intrapsychic go together. That this sometimes that people are somehow going within, finding something within themselves, within the psyche, and uh, benefiting from it. Another way that I like to talk. Well, this is actually Nico Grundman, who has a ketamine clinic in New York City, who is a good friend of mine, and he proposed this idea, which I think is excellent, and uh, I support. So you could think about. Um, psychedelic transformation or healing as there's a passive component. This can be often biological. In other words, it doesn't really matter what you're doing per se, but MDMA uh, done regulates the amygdala, it decreases fear response. Some sort of passive process is happening. There's the experiential. This is sort of the interaction between what's happening subjectively or during the, the moment of when is on a psychedelic and maybe what's also happening biologically. Of course, they're interconnected. Then there's the active, and this is what does a person do after their experience? And I hear this often mentioned with ketamine that there may be a period of neuroplasticity after. And so this is also where the behavioral component is really important. What is a person doing to sustain and maintain and introduce new ways of being in the, uh, in the world? This monitor is playing with me. Um, so some things that we talk about are sometimes people feel very alone in their experience, even when things go well. And so there's a process of um, decreasing isolation. Um, 
also we talk about basic ideas as psychedelics as amplifiers. People sometimes go into their psychedelic experiences naive and don't really understand that what's happening is not purely random in their experience, but it's something that's being potentially amplified. And I really, for anybody who is involved in integration, uh, please, psychedelic integration is not just the retelling of your experience. It can be a component of it, but sometimes talking about it is not, talking about the experience itself is not the way forward. And um, you know, sometimes it can be just a way to intellectualize what's, what kind of change is happening. So we talk about sometimes anchors. I really like that metaphor taking something from the psychedelic experience that had a lot of symbolic representation and that being an anchor that a person can reconnect to uh, when they're going on in their life to, to support change. We talked about the embodying a little bit uh, through various body type methods. And then this one, I, the last one I think is also really overlooked because sometimes the, the psychedelic experience can be about so much, well, at least in our society, about the individual. And we overlook how integration can be part of a communal process. Uh, either communal, but also, again, within relationships. How does the family support a person's change, or doesn't? How does that get in the way of, of maintaining benefits? So this is something that we bring in, again, into the therapy. We talk about it. Uh, we support a person. What are some barriers to change? Well, I use the, the armor here and this is, again, just my model. Uh, I think you could, this could actually fit quite well in the ACT model. ACT talks about cognitive flexibility. But I think about armor as a, as a way that it keeps a person safe, but it also severely limits their motion. It, it limits how they can be in the world. And one thing that may be happening with psychedelics, or maybe this is particular to MDMA, is that people are able to maybe take pieces of that armor off or maybe take it off completely and not be so stuck. But there's also, there's also, there are also vulnerable spots under that armor. And sometimes uh, it can be really difficult to feel what uh, th those feelings or that vulnerability. And so in my experience, psychedelic, uh, I guess to use the word healing, is not a linear process. Right? It, sometimes things get a little bit worse and we need to prepare clients to anticipate this and to know that sort of like the abstinence, um, uh, what is it, abstinence relapse? Violation. violation, thank you. I always forget that one. Uh, abstinence violation effect. That just because symptoms are coming back or things may be getting a little bit worse, it doesn't mean that they're broken or that things are necessarily going in a completely poor direction. And I like to say that psychedelics don't make the change for you. They just make change a lot easier. More psychedelic experiences are not always the solution. I get a little bit nervous sometimes with, when I work with people who are feeling unwell and their community may be telling them that they need to go back to the medicine. So we also, again, I, I don't take the position as a therapist that I should tell them not to go back. But I help them work with how they're feeling, what is coming up for them, maybe their ambivalence, and helping them make the best decision that they choose to make. We're not taking away autonomy from them. So here's some things I like to talk about. If we assume that it's correct that psychedelic experiences are like 10 years of psychotherapy in eight hours, well, that's really fast change. That is going to have potentially ripples in a person's, say, family dynamics or people who are seeking that kind of quick change when that's, when that's what they're assuming will happen could be really frustrated when they realize that, well, actually, they are going to have to walk up that mountain, or that there are, there are things that they're going to have to do. And that's also part of the integration process. Somebody here made a really good point in my workshop that maybe it's like 10 years of insight, but not necessarily 10 years of change. And what can psychedelics change and what can they not? They're not panacea. So what happens if a person is feeling worse after a psychedelic experience? Again, there's this expectation of the results of the trials, but thing, one added level is sometimes there's disappointment. And as I, again, heard from a talk earlier, sometimes people have even experienced disappointment within the trials. But that's something that we also have to work with in, in the, the private practice setting. 
Right? They didn't achieve the results or their symptoms have come back. Sometimes the environment, as I mentioned, the family might not be supportive of a person's change. And then I mentioned this unfolding process, that it's not a linear improvement. And when things don't go well, there can be a turn to the self, or an sort of an attack on the self. Well, I tried everything, nothing worked, so I tried psychedelics, and that didn't work. And I'm therefore broken or um, flawed in some very, very deep ways. So as, as the sort of attention towards psychedelic increases and the expectations increase, we also have to be prepared for uh, other, other outcomes. So this is, I think, one of my last slides, and I don't want to totally end on a bum, bummer note, uh, but I I'll, will come back, don't worry. So I want to pose this question just out there, and I've mentioned it in a few places. Can a psychedelic experience be traumatic? And I don't necessarily mean cases where people are under the influence of a psychedelic and there's some form of abuse. That, that happens as well. But I'm talking about the experience itself. And... Um, it's funny, people, somebody once asked me, well, are you afraid to talk about this, that it'll sort of prime people to have these experiences? I, I don't think that's the case. But I want to, I have encountered cases, particularly with people who are not aware of what they're going into. Cases where, meaning, uh, they sort of try uh, ayahuasca on, on a whim, and then they have this, this experience. And so, um, I just want to challenge this idea that there is no such thing as a, a bad trip, I don't want to say that there are bad trips, but there can also be, there can also be a, a lot of, um, of anxiety that comes out of these experiences when they're really, really, really overwhelming. And then finally, I heard that there was a, a case report written on this. This is something also I've encountered. I'm really, really, really um, cautious around interpreting people's experience. I'm sorry, this is, I have really little ears. <laughs> I think this is why this is not working for me. Um, I, I'm really careful around interpreting the objective reality of people's experience. So there have been cases where a person has experienced abuse in their psychedelic trip. Of uh, They experienced abuse of a primary caregiver that doesn't really fit into any memory or even concept of that relationship. It's just purely uh, unfamiliar. And they come out of this experience and they ask the shaman, this is what I experienced in my uh, journey, is, is this real? And the shaman says, yes. You know, if this is what has appeared to you, this is what really happened. And um, this, this was really destructive for people's lives. Because it's really important that they, if, if it is true, even if it, I'm not the arbiter of truth, I can't know. Right? But I think it's really important for a person to arrive at that on their own, in their own way. Um, and this had really kind of destroyed a, a family. And we know that in the 90s, there was a pretty big wave of false memories, false memory kind of induction in therapy. Uh, and there's a wonderful researcher named Elizabeth Loftus who wrote about this. So if you're interested in it, I think it's something as a community we kind of have to be aware of and be cautious around. So to sum up, I kind of highlighted some of the challenges, but often integration can actually be a really, really smooth and beautiful process of, of, of observing somebody kind of come, come into a sort of, sort of bloom. And the unfolding process that takes place can sometimes be uncomfortable, can be bumpy, and we're there as integration therapists to support. And when there are longer-term negative consequences, which I've occasionally, it's rare, but I've seen it, um, it's really important to normalize and uh, these uh, negative kind of symptoms can resolve over time. So I really thank you for your attention today. Uh, and this is my contact information if you'd like to reach out. Thank you, Ingmar. We have time for questions, please. Hi, um, I just wondered, um, as, a, as a care provider, how you deal with the situation when people treat the psychedelic experience uh, as, a, as catharsis, as if that's their goal or what mm. they take from it? Um, I don't necessarily... Could you, uh, could you say a little bit more? What is it? Do you have a hesitation around that? Uh, no, I've just... Um, I'm 
I'm not a care provider, but I've just uh, uh, met several people that, in having discussions, that seems to be the goal of a psychedelic experience, and I have not, I, I lack context uh, for that, uh, and I'm just curious. So I, I, um, I think, it, you know, I work with the, the person, so if that's sort of what they think that the, the goal is, I'll explore it with them and try to sort of support them in it. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that that is the goal of a psychedelic experience to, it, that is what it's always about, catharsis. But I think there's also some, a little bit of wisdom in that because a lot of, this goes back to the body kind of conversation that maybe has been throughout the day of not just embodying but also experiencing things in the body and particularly when we, I'll speak to MDMA, we are bringing people's attention to what they're experiencing in the body. So catharsis is sort of this release or experience of, of emotion and it's energy to speak abstractly. But, um, and so I think it not being a psychedelic experience, not being too over intellectualized, but also be about some sort of um, expression is really important. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you're speaking a little bit about the phase after a psychedelic experience as one of potentially heightened neuroplasticity, which certainly gives this work quite a lot of bang for the buck therapeutically. But there's also, I think, a lot of epistemic responsibility that um, a, an integration therapist has because patients will be coming in with potentially radically altered beliefs about reality or about nature of their consciousness and so on. Do you believe that it's, it's a responsibility of an integration therapist to steer patients towards a direction of like naturalistic understanding of their mm. experiences so that they can perhaps remain as integrated into wider society epistemically as possible, or allow them to kind of go where, where they're, they're you know, naturally leaning, which might lead them to be potentially alienated and limited to like a smaller mm -hmm. subculture. Well, you know, again, sort of taking the position of supporting the, the, the client. So I'm not going to try to impose my... my I have a hesitation answering this question because we brought it up this is, uh, in the, the panel. So I'm going to kind of repeat what I've said before, which is that I don't uh, take a kind of necessary position of truth and try to guide them a particular way. But if, they're, if there's ways that they're thinking... Uh, that are, could be potentially harmful to them or others, that's when I'll begin to kind of, again, w uh, work with them in that way. And I, the other thing I mentioned is, you know, if somebody's coming to me um, for, say, like, shamanic healing, this actually, actually hasn't happened. I think people know that I work within the psychotherapy kind of framework. But if somebody came for me for that kind of work, I wouldn't work with them because that's not something that I do. So, so it's sort of knowing one's limits... Um, and also, but, but it is sometimes difficult, right? That edge that sometimes exists between what we think, what think, we think is right and maybe the kind of um, divergent place the person we're working with is going, yeah. Um, thank you, first of all. Um, I'm just curious, there's like, like another like danger or risk that I thought was associated with like psychedelic experience, what like Jung called inflation, that like mm. people come out of the experience and like attribute all what they've experienced to like their ego and just feel like they're God or something. And I haven't like heard this mentioned in this conference already, so I'm curious if you meet people who have come out of the experience with yeah inflation. I, I have, but not in my practice yet. <laughs> I don't know what that, that means. I, well, maybe it's a self-selecting population, right? Because people who are coming for help maybe are less inclined to... Unless the people around them are telling them that they're really narcissistic and need to, you know, seek help. But um, I have encountered it outside of the, cl the clinical setting, and um, I think what's important is to... If, if I were, I would be kind of help the person be aware of what kind of narrative he's or she is um, spinning around their experience, if that makes sense. You know, it gets to inflation. But, I, but, I, but I, I'm actually really interested in this topic because I wonder if some part of that is also part of the healing. You know, you don't want to get it overinflated, that's too much, but I wonder if, you know, we don't think of psychedelics as um, a, a drug that necessarily make people feel more confident and, and bolsterous, but um, 
I, people do seem to come out of psychedelic experiences, some people, with a greater sense of self-efficacy and um, sort of belief in themselves. You've mentioned it uh, in the beginning of your talk. Um, what would you recommend the therapists you, tra you are training if they are confronted with the question if oh. um, they have tried psychedelics themselves? How much time do we have? <laughs> um, this is part of a kind of longer... Well, what we do is we engage in a discussion with the audience about it. But um, the short version is that... Um, well, one way of thinking about it is that the person is looking for trust, right? They want to, to know whether they can trust you. That's, that's one motivation behind the question. And the thing that's difficult about that assumption is that it, it, it believes that if, if you had the experience and I've had the experience, therefore we have something in common, and we do, we've had the experience, but if you just sort of end there, then there is no understanding that actually is able to develop. Right? But, if you, but um, if you invite the person to, to engage in a conversation with you about what it is that you... We don't, we don't want to shut down meaning. We want to invite them to understand, okay, well, what was your experience like, though? I don't want to... Just because I had the experience, that doesn't mean I actually know what you went through, and vice versa, that it, just because you, know, you understand. Um, but disclosure, I think, has to be used in a way that is um, intentional, and I personally sometimes disclose and sometimes I don't, depending on uh, how I believe it may or may not be helpful. Sometimes there's ways where um, it does, it's, it's, it's something that can be said and then it just, it's just said and then we just move on. Um, let's see if I have anything more to add to that. I don't, there's more, but I don't necessarily want to get into it now. Yeah, I guess what I will say is that I'm lucky to have participated in MT2, which is the study that MAPS has uh, conducted where therapists can receive MDMA. So I have a, a way of speaking about this in a, in a legal uh, way. Yeah. Oh, one thing to also add, the, that your cultural context really matters, right? So just because I can speak about this or do this work in the United States doesn't mean that in some countries where... Uh, this, I'm not even talking about disclosing your own experience, but even doing this work might be more challenging, or maybe in the, in, in the institution you work with. So I always want to be sure to say that, make sure you kind of apply this to your own environment that you're working in. Thank you very much, Ingmar. Thank you.